Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our um, closing lecture. Today we have the pleasure to have uh, Sarah Whiting as our keynote speaker. And it has uh, been a long distance to travel, so we, we really appreciate that she has accepted our, our invitation. Sarah Whiting, a pr practicing architect and founder together with uh, Roman Whitty of WW Architecture Office, is now the William Ward Watkin Professor and Dean of the Rice School of Architecture sin since 2010. But she has an extended career as a teacher. Before joining Princeton in 2005, she was at the Harvard University Graduate School for, for Design for six years. Prior to that, she taught at the University of Kentucky, the Illinois Institute of Technology, and the University of Florida. She earned her Bachelor of Arts at Yale, a Master of Architecture at Princeton, and her PhD in the History, Theory, and Criticism of Art, Architecture, and Urban Form at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This wide range of educational institutions she has been involved with gives an idea of the treasured background she holds and the variety of ideas she has been able to manage when addressing the question of the education of an architect today. Presumably, it is also just a natural consequence of a restless character and an always willing to move on mind. This kind of call into action inspired the one that is probably her best known text, Notes Around the Doppler Effect, written with Robert Sumol in the first years of the new millennium and published in Perspective Number 33. Their encouragement to place critical practice at the center of the architectural discourse endowed them to be at the center of, the, of what has been called the postcritical debate, although they always referred to this position as projective. The critical project, defined as the struggle to clarify the binary con contradictions inherent to architecture, has proved to be exhausted. Although these polarities were great for Badakji, there is an urge to go beyond the situation, as Sarah herself has put it, not by choosing ideas, but by developing options. As for example, her idea of engaged autonomy a disciplinary approach to the project that takes into consideration not only its context, but also its legibility for those outside the discipline. Sarah's extensive activity as writer, lecturer, and member of editorial boards of journals such as Assemblage and, of course, Log, has put into play many other seminal concepts already to be taken as a departure point to rethink our own perspectives on architecture. Because, as she will say, the important thing is not so much where you start, but where you get. Please join me in welcoming her. Wow, it's a little hard to go after that. That was great. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for coming um, this afternoon. I, I will make one little comment on what you said, that um, it, it's actually very important that we use the term projective and not post-critical, because, in fact, Bob and I, and I certainly myself, I would speak for myself, um, believe very much in uh, that projective is based on the critical project and actually expands the critical project. So it was misconstrued as being against theory, post-critical and post-theoretical, and that was the uh, misinterpretation. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, this is a, a great um, conference, and actually I'm still having the morning session percolate in my head. I think that uh, uh, Luis Rojo's uh, articulation stemming from Peng's paper on the, the idea of singularities as a way of capturing moments when projects come together through design, through architecture, Okay. Uh, and and through, uh, through theory, through thinking, that there are certain moments as opposed to illustrating a theory, that, but these ideas of singularities as a way of articulating these projects that actually instigate change within the discipline, I think is a, a very good way of putting it. And I think in the end, we're all looking right now for a way of articulating how it is that 
we can move forward in terms of finding a project and finding that intersection as opposed to constantly rehearsing these binaries that are getting quite tiresome and creating camps that are uh, deadening the discipline. And so I think that's a very good one. Um, I think that the, the, everyone is finding a way to articulate an expanded version of autonomy where there's the right term to keep architecture alive, let's say, if uh, autonomy, and so as Sylvia mentioned, I've used the term engaged autonomy of a sense of uh, something that has a clear project within, but is also tied to other disciplines and other, other um, ways of seeing other publics. I'm not gonna speak about that specific argument as much today, but, um, but that's in the background certainly of this, of this paper and this, this thinking. So I think we're in an interesting moment. Um, architecture today is, is not what you could call an authorial moment. There's no dominant paradigm. And that's, um, a, that's a fact that's at once liberating and a little bit terrifying. It, it obliges us to look very carefully at the now, at how we got here, the recent past, at the longer arc of that trajectory, architectural history, but also the cultural history that got us here, and then to choose what we think is important or what we think is relevant. And it's that last part that often gets dropped off, I think, um, to our detriment. So we need, I would argue, so my, my, the title of my paper is called Looking Good. I think that we need to look good. That's always a plus. And looking across this crowd, I would say, yeah, you guys look pretty good. Um, I think you have that covered, and, but we also need to take a good look. We need to look carefully. To put it another way, we're at a critical moment for architectural thinking, both for schools and for practice. We're at a divide between one road, one where architecture aims for cultural relevance, or another road which leads to architects becoming service providers and problem solvers. As a practitioner, a writer, and a dean, I'd advocate the urgency of the former. While this problem is quite simple, the contexts that brought us to this moment aren't. So this talk will engage several of those contexts, but not all of them, and as I already warned Sylvia, it's a little bit rough. This is a, a talk that is uh, a, a paper that is in progress, and so it has a few threads that are frayed, and I look forward to your questions to help suture those together at the end. So um, first, I've been intrigued by a strange consensus that seems to have blanketed not just architectural discourse, but general thinking about architecture, which is an, an idea that the object is bad. Now, this is different from the crisis of the object, which has been a refrain of modernity since the Enlightenment. Rather than a crisis, we seem to have on our hands right now a shunning of the object. A second strain of consensus is similarly within our discourse, but also part of a more general tendency, and that's the shunning of theory. Now, typically, I'm not a big crisis person. Anxiety, crises, apocalypse. We have plenty of these themes on the nightly news, and that I don't have a great desire to ferret those out and make them my topics. But I am intrigued when there are um, uh, moments of consensus or sort of a, a common denominator at play. And so I think one should never ignore consensus. And one, when one starts to find consensus over points like this, this is what interests me. Because I fear that this combination of turning our backs on the object um, and our backs on theory results in an emptying of architecture's ambition or cultural value. What's also interesting to me is that the object has recently enjoyed a, res a resurgence of interest and attention within contemporary research and writing in art history that's focused on materiality, craft, and perception. This trend hasn't translated to architecture, however, for some reason, these discussions invoke anxieties within our field, and I'll talk about all of those anxieties in a minute, um, but we also have the added complication in architecture of a disinterested subject. So while the subject who views arts objects is always an interested subject, or maybe sometimes a child who is forced to go to a museum and not so interested but is still there, um, and often a singular one, architecture necessarily engages a collective subject. My interest in the collective subject do dovetails with a long-standing interest I've had in the one and the many. I came to architecture via political theory and via a very basic question that underlies political theory. 
How do individuals operate together as a political society, or frankly, as any society? How do we, as all these singular people, really work together in the different societies that we have? We're all one and the many, and that's particularly true when it comes to our architectural audience. Our collective subject is comprised of an endless number of ones, and famously, as Walter Benjamin pointed out already in 1936, it's a disinterested audience. Architecture, he noted, is experienced in a state of distraction. That's evident in this André Cortez photo taken in Paris around the time when Benjamin was uh, making that observation. It's even more true today, of course, thanks to the urbanistically lethal combination of smartphones and dumb people. So back to the shunning of the object. A, a couple of years ago, the American magazine Architecture ran an editorial by Ned Kramer, who's a Rice alumnus, I might add, and this editorial caught my attention. After acknowledging that he had never been an ACE student, perhaps I shouldn't be so quick to announce proudly that he's a Rice alum, Kramer proclaimed that he's, quote, never been big on theory, and he went on to delight in the conclusion that he drew upon surveying the contemporary architectural scene. Social relevance, sustainability, and building performance, he noted, have supplanted theory in the hearts, minds, and rhetoric of our leading practitioners and academics. I find Kramer's conclusion troubling, but while I don't share his glee, I can't really say that he's wrong. And I wonder, as we find ourselves in this moment of transition, why it is that seemingly across the board, there indeed appears to be a distinct refusal to theorize certain important trends that are happening in architecture right now. So in this short presentation, I'd like to look first more closely at this contemporary rhetoric and practice of responsibility and, and the role of theory. And second, why it is that responsibility seems obliged to shed theory and also the object. Even before the economic crash, a rhetoric of responsibility began to manifest itself through a critique of what was termed architecture, as you can see here in this poster for a panel discussion. The answer in this conference, the, the conference of um, you know, who, what to make of architecture and who to blame for it, that sort of key question that's showing that it's not exactly celebratory, and the answer in this conference and in similar forums that happened at that same time can be encapsulated by Ricky Burdett's succinct conclusion. With the blurring of the boundaries across disciplines, Burdett said, you're recognizing that you don't solve the problem with an object building. Everything belongs to context in the city. This theme of targeting the object building again appeared when Michael Kimmelman took over the position of architecture critic at the New York Times. Kimmelman has deliberately avoided writing about singular buildings, quote, repoliticizing his beat by focusing on housing projects, urban planning, and the street. As he explained, he said, I spent 20 years as an art critic. He's not an architecture critic by training. He was an art critic. I spent 20 years as an art critic writing about sculpture and artists. I get it. To talk about a building as if it were a sculpture is a legitimate way of seeing it, but it's also an impoverishment of the various things that have gone into thinking about that building and to the life of that building and the people who use it. So this is the architecture critic for the New York Times, talking as if architecture's aesthetics were identical to those of sculpture, for one, and further, as if it were impossible to talk simultaneously about a building's aesthetics and its life. A final example hits quite, is quite fresh and hits especially close to home. Ron and I had, in other words, WW, this large office in Houston, Texas, we run. Um, WW had a small project, or, or we had a project, in a small recent show at the Chicago Art Institute, and the show was called Chicagoisms, and you can see it here on the wall. Our project is this one here. Our project was for a single building that fills its entire block, but through its geometry creates urban relationships both within the building and from the building to its surroundings. This is an example of what I term urban or um, engaged autonomy in other contexts. So we were given, as were all the people in this exhibit, we were given only 150 words to explain our project. So we used that very short space, that's not very long, to argue that the object can and should be a generator. That was our text, so-called I object. In his review of the exhibition, Chicago Tribune architecture critic Blair Kamen called out only three projects from the show, including ours, 
which is nice except that he called it out with condemnation. He said, other models like I Object by Ron Witte and Sarah Whiting of Houston provoke with their arrogant defense of buildings as objects bereft of concern for the urban environment or for saving energy. Now, it's telling that Cayman felt entirely comfortable concluding that our attention to the object meant that we had an utter disregard for the environment. It was, a, it was to him, utterly obvious. To me, it's, it's baffling. So these are only a few among countless examples of contemporary jabs at architecture's objecthood. All of them associate singularity with sculpture, iconicity, in short, architecture. All of them equate objecthood with social, environmental, and civic irresponsibility. And all evacuate architecture's core agency, that is design. Responsibility, on the other hand, in these arguments, is equated with anything but the object. Responsibility is about relations, origins, use, life, and context. This tight binary between objecthood and responsibility leaves practitioners and critics alike very little running room. A general consensus has slowly but decidedly emerged that a focus on the building, on its objecthood, and certainly on its form is simply irresponsible and therefore taboo. And again, this is within the American context primarily, so it might be utterly foreign to you as an argument, but it's important for us. This context object opposition has led to the curious situation whereby architects and students try to design architecture without designing a building. Here, for example, you have the results of a studio from a school in Manhattan. To retain anonymity, let's just say it's a school on 116th Street. It's a proposal for an aquaponic system for producing food on a waterfront site in Queens, but as you can see from the boards reproduced here, there's actually very little architecture on the, on the boards. There's more information detailing the fish story than detailing any architectural ambition. Now we know that architecture is a generalist discipline, but if we don't teach students how to design architecture, who will? There are plenty of scientists in the world who know the details of aquaponic farming. Our job is to work with them rather than to try to become them and to work with them through design. Sure, we need to be able to communicate with other specialties, but it's imperative that we keep design at the center of our enterprise. Now, advocating for design doesn't mean that architects turn into service providers. It's sad even to have to point that out. Already in 1947, Moholy Naj argued that designing is not a profession, but an attitude of resourcefulness and inventiveness. I think it's a very beautiful quote. The act of designing can be understood in many ways, but basically it's a representation drawn or modeled to figure out and also to represent the form and program of an object. Objects can mean anything from the scale of clothing to furniture to a city. So how did we get here, to quote David Byrne? In the next part of this talk, I'm going to skip through the 20th century with reckless abandon, but it's in an effort to lay out a critical thread that I think can help keep architecture relevant if we don't let that thread get severed. Now, the term Gesamtkunstwerk, a total work of art, or synthesis of the arts, was first coined in the 1820s by the German philosopher Karl Friedrich Trondorf, though it wasn't really until opera composer Richard Wagner's use of it in the 1840s that it really took root as a concept. And then it was Gropius who brought the idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk into architecture with the Bauhaus School, which offered a pedagogical Gesamtkunstwerk, a whole form of education that was tied to the arts. Um, all of the arts and crafts. In any case, we can point to any number of modern projects that synthesized in this way. Charles and Ray Eames are perhaps the most obvious, but really the whole modern project was a way of living, a way of perceiving, and a way of making. It wasn't just a mishmash of everything. It was held together as a synthetic, active whole that had its definition as a project, but was also affected by the other disciplines that it crossed into. It's critical not to interpret this synthetic project, which I find very interesting, as one of total control in the Howard Rourke sense, however. There's a fine line between the obsessive control of a Howard Rourke and the idea of architecture as a project, a synthetic project for an ambition that can surpass, should surpass, a single iteration. 
Think, for example, of Mies and his project that grew across the Resor House, the Farnsworth, the 50 by 50 House, the Bacardi headquarters, the National Gallery. Structure enables relationships. Glass captures the world in images. Platforms stage newly fertile grounds. Each iteration in this sequence is a step towards or part of a larger project. Each is an end in itself, and each intersects with other lineages, other projects by Mies, other projects by others, and other revolutions in the world at large. Architecture or design has always remained at the heart of this synthesis. Even Peter Eisenman's houses, recognized perhaps as the apex of autonomous architecture, his neo-avant-garde turn back to modernism's linguistic roots, was a th synthesis of architecture's modern history, contemporary art practices, philosophy, and linguistics, but always with architecture at its very center. Now, about a half century has passed since we, architects, critics, patrons, and publics, began the long walk down the path that was meant to lead us to architecture after modernism. It's been an extraordinary stroll, at times a running romp. This 50-year-long constitutional has borne unbelievable riches. New aesthetic possibilities, new technological capabilities, new ways of living, and new means of working. Looking across this history, it's hard for the heart not to race. It turns out that architecture is everything. We know that now. And yet, we, architects and critics, find ourselves suffocated today by the stifling mugginess of everything as everything brushes up against everything else in pursuit of something more. It's become hard for architecture to breathe, let alone run. Furthermore, paradoxically, architecture's exponential expansion seems only to have diminished its patrons and publics. Architecture's societal role is increasingly elusive, the architect, client, builder, banker relationship is not what it once was. The idea that architecture embodies something akin to progress is decreasingly obvious. If under the modern project, architecture, modern project and its progeny, architecture was still at the core of the synthetic project, intersecting other disciplines like economics, technology, politics, but architecture was still at the core of that project, Contemporary architecture has simply, uh, well, contemporary architecture, especially after the Alice of 1968, has simply and utterly atomized into separate practices, much like the installation My Personal Universe by the Chinese artist Zhang Wang. In short, with so much everything going on, it's no wonder that this vital relationship has foundered. Today's Alice has overwhelmed architecture. So the synthetic project that once held together all of these things that were attached to architecture has broken apart into a series of fragments where architecture is no longer at the, at the core of this um, and no longer has the power to hold it all together. So we can't stop, rewind, and put the modern synthetic project back together again. It's regressive to think that that might be possible. Rather than falsely resuturing the modern object to retrieve the synthetic project, I propose that we seek traction by putting Alice or everything on hold for a moment and setting our sights instead on a very specific something, which is architecture's dependence on the relationship between representation and building. This may be a, a slightly naive proposition as a way of, of finding a, a way forward, um, but it's a way of directing a future where we have agency specific, specific or specificities of representation and building. Representation here means the tool set that architects use to conceptualize, design, and communicate intentions drawings, models, renderings, diagrams, videos, words, histories, analogs, comparisons. Building means just that, the constructed thing, the occupied space, the moment of getting something built followed by the arc of a given architecture's sustained existence. The renewal of the object that I'm advocating in short is tied to both representation and building and is a way of reintroducing the synthetic project that keeps architecture and design and the object relevant. Why is this relationship important? Because representation and building are architecture's principal interlocutors. 
Architecture's use of representation should never be mere illustration. Representation is the most precise, the most incisive means of cutting into and rethinking the cultural geographies upon which architecture thrives. Building, meanwhile, is architecture's publicness made manifest. Building is the embodiment of what wasn't there before, a future right now. Architects and critics seem to have lost interest in coupling representational dexterity and building expertise as mutual provocateurs. I fully acknowledge that matchmaking these two is actually hard work. Representation and building can be antagonistic cohorts. But together, they're architecture's lifeblood. Together, they form a cultural desire, an exhilaratingly unpredictable provocation to change the world. Together, I would argue, they offer a means of forging an engaged autonomy. Nowhere is the need for rekindling the project of the representation building relationship more urgent than in architectural education, which is fast separating into multiple estranged cohorts. What I'd like to do at this point is sort out um, several different branches of these cohorts to better explain the current status of this building representation relationship. Uh, and again, admittedly, my sorting is being done with a, an American lens. Um, when imbalanced, the, the, the building representation relationship, when that's imbalanced, the relationship parses out into four categories, at least, that influence architectural education, two of which prioritize the building and two of which prioritize representation. So these are, I'm going to rough, go quite quickly over four different groups that uh, have taken this relationship and imbalanced it towards one end to the detriment of the other, and I think as a result are, are hurting their, their uh, general projects. So first, there are those who want academia to more closely resemble building practice, usually aligning this mandate with paying more attention to financing, schedules, regulations, policies, performance metrics, and project delivery systems. These are the tools of the professional trade. And there's nothing wrong with these metrics until they become the only arbiters of architectural success. So for some, these tools have acquired an outsized representational legitimacy in architecture, an evaluative role that has overwhelmed architecture's cultural significance. James Kramer, the editor of Design Intelligence, epitomizes this cohort as, as illustrated by his proposal to improve architectural education. This was an article that he published in his own magazine. Step six, so he had 12 steps in his proposal. Step six, so securely in the middle of his list, blatantly foregrounds fiscal and business issues in design education. Now, anyone who's ever built anything would absolutely agree that exposing students to the business side of practice is critical, but defining education primarily through a business lens dramatically curtails the possibilities of architecture schools fostering new options. So here you have the, the uh, building side completely overwhelming this relationship and subsuming representation into its building or business uh, metric meter. Uh, and not allowing for representation to push at the building reality to help turn it into something that could go forward. Another cohort that favors the building side of the representation bu building equation focuses attention on the design specificities underlying a building, the details of mass, form, organization, structure, program, and technique. Now, when coupled with cultural impact, these design specificities transform from being documentation to carrying ambition. But when they're artificially divorced from culture, becoming instead boxes and lines on paper, they similarly run the risk of grossly imbalancing architecture. In other words, these, this is a group that focuses on decidedly building or architectural concerns, but uh, totally absent of any representational or cultural side, and therefore, again, imbalance this relationship to a detriment. And we all know people who fall into these different categories within um, architectural education and even practice. Oops. Now, any given project's ambition gains currency through representation. Plans, sections, facades, and other design articulations act, in other words, like the currency of paper money by putting a building into circulation. So representation operates as a way of circulating a building beyond its physical presence, I would argue. 
It's very important that way. Representation can proliferate to buildings' impact. Without a design education, it's almost impossible to know how to use this currency as anything but image, however. It's like opera singers who can adopt a foreign tongue perfectly as sounds, but not as language. A number of architectural historians and critics simply don't know how to read buildings in their, in their, their built reality, because they, they simply don't have the ability to read what a building can produce. Um, and they don't necessarily have the ability to read buildings through drawings, and so they can only talk about projects in literally superficial terms. I think this is a very um, important point. It's maybe, again, uh, more significant within the U.S., but the tendency in the U.S. of architectural historians doing PhDs not having uh, architectural training has led to a group of historians who talk about everything but the um, exigencies of building and then leave out um, whole ambitions that are actually behind these drawings uh, and are incapable of reading drawings as anything but image. Um, think of the challenge of reading Mirais's project if you have no training in architecture whatsoever. These are almost impossible to understand, right? Because of the challenge of reading and producing architecture, it's easy to imbalance architecture in favor of the representational side, which re can result in another form of myopia. So even for those with a design formation, there will always be the divide between design and building. Education shouldn't be hamstrung by the exigencies of reality, but it shouldn't be so cut off from them as to reduce design to image. And then those are, there are those who see uh, architecture culture as existing entirely outside the impositions of building. Oops, now I don't quite know how to go back, so let me see, hang on. Voila, thank you. Now I know Spanish. Okay, so then, then, there, then, there, then there are those who see architecture culture as existing entirely outside the impositions of building. So representation is the alpha in this view, and building is simply the fulfillment of, and sometimes the compromise of, loftier representational ambitions. Here, representation is free to take up the rapidly shifting and urgently relevant terrains of social activism, urbanism, populism, environmentalism, history, and intellectual theory. Freedom from the constraints of building and of design permits assertion in the decidedly rhetorical terms that come with architecture as a form of cultural critique. And it's, that's often the very architecture that we teach. Ask architecture students to list 10 projects and bets, on, bets are on that at least half of what they name will be unbuilt work. That's not to say that the many unbuilt projects that form part of our collective canon were deliberately designed not to be built, however. Most were done with the optimistic belief that they would be constructs of a new and better world, maybe in five years, maybe in 10, but there was a, a sense of, of an aspiration to uh, changing an existing reality, um, not to operating outside of it. One or another obstacle came into play, constructability, clients, codes, costs, Often these obstacles appear to compromise the underlying architectural aims, but taking the time to read these obstacles more closely may open escape hatches, loopholes, new ways of practicing that will permit subsequent efforts to advancing more important aims. In other words, I'm not arguing that the purely representational project is taboo. It can actually have an incredible impact on, on design and on, on practice. Um, but if, it's, if a, a project is designed purely representationally without that aim or ambition, um, then it's not taking advantage of the possibilities of, of actually affecting change. Paradoxically, freedom from building places severe limits on our effectiveness. Freedom from building means we'll never provide the future right now. Uh, and not making forays into the embodiment of that world means that much of what we do runs the risk of ultimately becoming overlaid with or overcome by futility, cynicism, or self-satisfaction, a hollowed out relevance. That's precisely where too many projects land when they are situated purely on the representational side, projects that even when built are little more than materialized cartoons, 
collaging clever references together with techniques that reduce architecture to rhetorical stage sets. These examples, the builders who obsess about metrics, the critics who read architecture in the absence of culture, the critics who read culture in the absence of building, and the designers who, re who design representations, all shortchange the potential for architecture to advance culture. All too often, we see representation and building as either means or ends, whereas the history of architecture suggests that it is far more productive to see representation and building as means and ends. Representations beget better buildings, and buildings beget better representations. Now, the pairing of representation and building demands time, time to develop and time to be constructed. An architect's project lies in her or his ability to interrogate the discipline. The intertwined threads of means and ends are neither absolute nor are they arbitrary. Architecture advances slowly, inching forward through calculated manifestations that are at times representational, at other times built. Not all moments are relevant, though all are part of the process. But an architectural process is not an architectural ambition. Only specific distilled hypotheses can articulate and advance a cultural project. Recognizing these particular moments that come together to construct an architectural aim also demands precision. Not the precision of the pencil on vellum or ink on mylar crispness that defined architectural education of the past, but the precision that keeps one from succumbing to the siren's call of the perpetual Google search or the endless algorithmic alternative. We all complain about being short on time, and yet we surf, skim, and survey our way across architecture daily, even hourly, consistently shortchanging ourselves by stingily avoiding spending the time needed to understand, produce, or even argue for architecture. So the reinvigoration that will emerge from the reassertion of representation building, reassertion of the representation building relationship in an architectural education requires time and precision. Adding time is impossible, particularly given the short-sighted mandate to reduce time to degree which is a, a phrase common in the US right now. The only plausible way to find time for architecture, the means and ends of representation and building, is paradoxically not by expanding, but by editing. That is, by the deliberate and at times slow construction of precise intersections of architecture and culture. Dimensions, divisions, and definitions all translate cultural resonance into architectural form program affects and is affected by architectural form. Technique is how that form is put together and how it stays put. The exigencies of contemporary practice, ranging from the details of financing to the details of material connections, need to be understood so as to negotiate and advance them. Rather than accumulating options, what passes for research, students need to be taught how to read culture within architectural specificities and how to judge one option relative to one another, what options further their aims, and which ones distract, which options will join representation and building to advance culture. So here you have our curriculum diagram, which is quite simple. It's a little bit like washing your hair, where you rinse, uh, you put shampoo, you rinse, and then you repeat. This is, you make a proposition, you test it, you, you uh, change that proposition, you test it again. So it's a constant uh, loop-de-loop -loop of, of proposing something, pushing it with uh, the, the test, and then reproposing it. And here you can see the curriculum in context with design at the center with the other uh, fields that, that come into play. Architecture students have the reputation of working all the time. But too many are simply spinning their wheels, trying to do everything, producing more and more with the hopes that something will emerge. It's a little bit like the continued project of Alice, of constantly expanding. By rekindling the volatile but prolific relationship between representation and building, we can seed new genealogies, building upon existing projects and articulating new ones. We can foster a new synthetic object that's tied into other disciplines, other contexts, but that doesn't lose itself in that process. 
That's how architecture can regain its relevance. And rather than becoming a practice of server, service providers, it's how architecture can make a future right now. And to me, that's looking good. And I finished far faster than I expected to. So, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, that was a very uh, uh, fascinating talk, and I agree with just about everything you say. And I'm I'm very encouraged by the fact that you know, uh, uh, yes, representation and building cannot be sort of separate realms. And um, but I I have a bit of a, a question about why you see the notion of service as perhaps belonging to the first of the four, the professionalists, uh, the builders who ignore uh, design and representation, because really isn't architecture inherently, uh, isn't good design finally uh, uh, just really providing a good service? Isn't uh, even uh, architectural introspection and uh, uh, let's say the autonomous side of architecture, uh, isn't even that uh, a service that we that we provide to society or to um, I, I don't know why you why you exclude I think that, that maybe I wasn't clear because essentially with all four of those categories they're they're offering something beneficial so the same with the purely representational project there's a side there that's important but it's so divorced from building that it's it's often la la land. The, the problem I have with the purely service project, so it's, it's that, it's the isolation, so the, and the idea that architectural education should be all about service. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, um, that's an extreme group, but it's actually quite a powerful lobby, especially in the US in education right now. So while it seems absurd to think that there could be people who propose um, uh, that, that, that that extreme gain that much dominance within architectural education, that's a reality. So if you read Kramer's article, it's actually, I think, a kind of alarming view of what an architectural education should be that's subsumed under the service mandate. And so, as I say, I think it's important for students to be exposed to finance, to um, issues of uh, making a building stand up properly, all of these things. But when that becomes uh, so primary that all innovation and speculation or ways of pushing it, the metrics that exist because of precedent, that's when I think we have an issue. So that's, it's that extreme that I was pointing out. Yeah, because I think it's arguable that you could say that um, even the most autonomous aspects of architecture, um, well, you, for example, you showed a slide of Walter Benjamin um, the quote yeah. where he talks about, you know, the attentive gaze of a tourist before a famous building. And uh, um, I live in Barcelona and uh, it's a city that uh, has sort of developed a kind of architecture of tourism in a, in a, in a very, you know, it's all about architecture, but it's also, <laughs> there's also a, a service element sure. to it. And I, uh, but I mean, that's problematic it, in its own way. 95% of what's built, um, yeah. people aren't looking at. Yeah. Even architects. So yeah. it's it's that's that's one side of sort of we we operate within. Yes, it's great when your your building is part of the tourist circuit for one reason or another. You know, maybe someone was murdered there. Uh, but but it's the the fact is we have an audience that's not necessarily paying attention, um, which I think is an interesting challenge mm -hmm. for us. Our, our architecture's audience is is not a very easy one to put our finger on. <laughs> so I think what, when, um, one of the most interesting things today about some of the most interesting work being done is this idea precisely that representation has its own uh, autonomy and I think when it's understood in an intelligent way what that means is that through the process of design the different representations of the project don't su substitute each other but somehow that each of them remain as an object that has a value in and of itself and we see and they all form a constellation where the the final built uh, result is perhaps just one more of these different uh, iterations but i think what you were proposing seemed a little bit more uh, 
precise in that you were putting building and representation on some sort of equal footing that was more, there was more precision to that statement. I don't know if you could elaborate. I, no, I think your point is a good one, and I think that um, the issue is making sure that people understand that, that the, the building is another representation, and that representations can operate um, uh, like buildings in their own right, but with that spectrum that you lay out, there's an interesting relationship where the one is affecting the other, and they're, they're part of a constant, you, you you, the, the photographs that you write about are um, very important for influencing the, the built project and, and vice versa. That there's a, um, they, they're on an equal footing, but they're constantly pushing at each other to change. And I think that, so I think that it's only through, and obviously I'm approaching this topic as uh, through pedagogy, through this idea of, of how, do you, how do we get students to recognize these ideas, because then they'll be incredible um, contributors to our field. And so how do we make sure that they understand, even though they won't build a building, how do we make them understand that their representations are actually still informed by and, and constantly bouncing back and forth with the real, the, what might be a built version of that same project? And that that can make their representation something that won't be made in the art department. Just like if someone who can do that bounce from the history department understands how the building can affect an argument um, in ways, won't be doing it as someone who could just have an art history degree or a history degree. So it's, it's, um, it's a precision that probably is more within um, uh, laying it out clearly within a, a pedagogical project. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Um, uh, it might be uh, um, a bit complicated, but I'm interested in this idea that in the, um, in the 70s uh, there, were, there was also uh, a concept that uh, actually uh, representation might substitute architecture. Mm -hmm. The space of architecture could be produced within representation and didn't need to leave it. And Cardboard it's, architecture. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, and it's, uh, it's a problem that was linked to, to, to the postmodern theory. Uh, this is another kind, another interpretation of, of what representation is. What, what, how, do you, how would you frame the difference between those two kinds of representation? No, I think that's a very valuable question, especially right now as the economy is, is low. Um, representational work is, again, in great production, right? Um, no, it's a, it, and it's a question I don't have a quick or easy answer to, but I think that if you compare, for example, um, Eisenman's drawings before he got any of the houses built or even during the process of, of the houses, uh, as a, I mean, where he certainly, his buildings are another form of representation, really, there's no divide between the, the, the houses as they were built and the drawings and the, the models that were done. I think, I, w I would argue that there is a difference, maybe it's a difference in time and precision, in the, the amount of time that was put into those projects and the fact that those projects had a very broad reach. But I admit maybe it's also a, um, an acknowledgement of a kind of anxiety of, of pop culture as being a form of uh, sort of that easy, so I think that the sort of cartoony representational crowd today uh, you could argue they're building what they're, what they're drawing and vice versa. Um, I would argue that it's too easy, it's too quick, um, and the references aren't profound enough to actually change society. They may merely reflect society, but that might be a reflection of my own intellectual arrogance, I admit. So it's, I think that's something really to work out, but I admit to having a visceral reaction against the cartoon versus the sort of obsessive drawing as a, as a means of representation. But it's, it's, you know, this is where I say this is a topic that I'm, I'm working on. But I've been intrigued by the cartoon and the comic for a long time and trying to figure out um, where it introduces something useful for our discipline. I think play is interesting, but where it also gives me great anxiety. So it's, it's a very, it's a key question, I think, for the work. Okay, so now almost everyone I know has asked a question. Some people who don't know me are, are sort of forced to uh, come up to the plate too. Okay. 
and then we'll we'll have a discussion afterwards. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm very um, actually very happy that the word object, although you, your emphasis is on on this last part, but I right. I I do want to um, point out the fact that the word object is is back actually in our in our discourse. Um, like you said. Um, uh, the getting away from this from this word had to probably had to do with this engagement of the pure discipline of architecture, and so uh, getting away from the object was getting away from our disciplinary um, abilities to actually build. So um, coming back to the object is actually um, a way of identifying ourselves with the experts in in the actual building. Um, but to me, it has also has to do with a way of understanding architecture as a anchorage to reality. Let me, and let me try to get this across pr properly. Um, the object, if I understand in your terms, is actually the, the way that we're able to anchor all these disciplines so that Architecture is not everything. Right. It's the, the object I'm using loosely as, because it also is, is the representation. The object is design. Exactly. Right. So, so, then, so then instead of the object being the opposite of context, context, instead of the object being irresponsible, the object is precisely the opposite. Mm -hmm. It is the responsibility of knowing that only through the object, of the definition, of the precise definition of the object, there we are able to then affect the context that I think you are actually um, defending and that I totally agree with. So that we're actually defining this boundary between object and context, right. which is probably the boundary which representation is actually put out there. In other words, we all have, we all have students that win these, con th these competitions mm -hmm. that are all representation. I have an example from this year, right? The, but the reason why she wins this, this, uh, this, this, this um, competition is because she is forced to define the boundary. In other words, the bearing wall that ties it to a context that is physical, that is, that is real. So then, what I'm, tr what I'm trying to understand in your, in your discourse, and I try to agree with, is that only when the object meets context, in other words, only when the definition of the boundary, in other words, what we're experts in, do we really engage with reality and, with, and the possibility of changing society from our own very d d humble, specific discipline. Do, do you understand? I think that's true. I think, so I, I do think there's a very different context here because I do think, I mean, you get a famously strong technical education um, and, and yet I will say that, that um, Etsam to me seems to be the sort of center of a place where that technical education is married with some very smart speculative cultural knowledge. And I think that the, so the, the again, I'm speaking with a, a specifically American context. I think where we often shortchange the technical education, in part, people are impatient, they're eager, architecture is everything, they get excited by everything around it. And so they often will um, leapfrog over those specificities, as you say, the, the precise moments where we have something we can contribute to get very excited and involved in the stuff around. And so um, that is, you know, you're right, that, but, my, but that argument that you nicely rephrased, I think may not make as much sense in the context here because the, uh, you don't have that, as much of that problem, I think, as, as we do. But so I think that this, this divorce of, um, let's say, a, both a faith in what architecture can do, but also a willingness to put the time in, because it takes a lot of time to figure out how to really operate through architecture. Um, and I think that it's, that's, it's that um, difficulty there that, that has been uh, part of the problem for um, leading to this divide, even more so than the alas, let's say. Um, so. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>